I come from a musical family. Um, my mom is a classical piano player. Um, my brother is a clarinet player. Um, so I grew up in the classical music uh, scene in my hometown and College of Music there. Uh, so I graduated in, in violin and viola uh, when I was like 18, 20 year old and around uh, 14, 15 year old I came in contact with uh, traditional music, especially Irish music. Just standard sort of piano lessons at five, violin lessons at eight. Um, and when I was about 12 or 13, mum and dad got me a very nice violin. And like two weeks later, I brought home the rubbish school viola. They were delighted. I met the lads from Session A9 in a, a night out in Liverpool. They'd been to their gig and then we got very drunk and uh, stayed out all night. And I stayed in touch with them. And then I went to the Highlands for this fiddle weekend after saying, I'd love to learn a few tunes. And it was meant to be a holiday. It wasn't meant to be a career changing moment. Um, but I just, I loved the freedom and I'd spent so long being told you have to do it this way and this is the way, this is the notes, this is, you know. And then it was like, I turned up and they're like, you can do what you want. I was like, well, what's the bow? And they're like, whatever you feel like. I was like, oh, okay. And then I actually got back from that first weekend and I wrote the first tune I'd ever written. So I, it was quite freeing, actually. And then I just moved up. I grew up in New Hampshire. Um, which most people don't know where that is and it's one of the states it's sort of in between Boston and Massachusetts and Canada um, and uh, the part of New Hampshire that I'm from has this music school like a community music school so yeah I started I started taking classical lessons um, but then um, trad was way more exciting difficult to be completely brief because what I do is a bit odd um, but when I was maybe five years old I went to the Roybridge Village Hall and my best friend's older brother Duncan Strawn was playing the cello he was playing a popper gavotte and he's child prodigy genius you know now he's the world's oldest child prodigy but then he was a child um, and I was really enjoying this and my mother just looked over at me and says mm, do you want to do that and it so happened that his teacher, Audrey Scott, who's a legend in the local community, set up all sorts of music tuition and stuff like that, was sitting right there. So we asked her and she said, yeah. So we ended up doing that for years. Where I come from, there is not a traditional, uh, like a, there's not a music tradition. Uh, so uh, seeing someone playing my instrument, so the, the instrument I was already used to, uh, to play um, and to make music with, uh, um, used in a different way. Traditional music or folk music at school was this terrible string band that just played everything really slow and really twee reels and it actually put me off when I was 15, I was like, folk music, no. But it was just the way it was delivered wasn't, wasn't great. It, it felt like it was more free uh, and I was free to play in my own way my own tune, perhaps my own composition, um, that uh, brought me to Ireland. Uh, so I went. I, I left Italy when I was twenty-two. Uh, it was two thousand eight. Uh, moved to Limerick to study Irish music, and then from there, got interested in so many other traditions. I studied in College of Music in Stockholm. I studied world music. Uh, there um, I lived in different places um, from Sweden then I moved to uh, to Scotland um, 2016. I uh, had been working as sort of a groundsman on a country estate. I was doing like arborist, uh, arborism stuff and looking after partridges and things but then the estate got bought up by a Russian billionaire who made most of the staff redundant. Rufus was at the RCS at the same time that I was there. Um, and we were flatmates. Rufus and Emma asked uh, me and Madeline to join the, the band uh, at the same time. So uh, yeah, I didn't think much about it in the sense it didn't take, didn't take long to, to say yes. Yeah, the Rufus quartet came about from this love I have of 
string quartets and chamber music and trad tunes and like I, I, I found a similarity so when I was studying chamber music and string quartets there was this thing about it being a very intimate music and um, a lot of sort of communication that goes on with without the player you know, there's no conductor in a string quartet it's all communication that goes on in the music and then when I came to Scotland I saw that in trad that sort of same essence but in a totally different way you know there's still people still communicate uh, their feelings and the intensity with movement and 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 the, again there's no conductor and I saw a similarity there but then you get this different vibe and there's no music I and mean, it's just um, feeling I suppose so I wanted to like match the two similarities in the different genres and see what could happen. Well the thing about a string quartet is that if you were to condense all of the the history of classical music right and if you were to put it in like this is the way I think of it it's a bit weird right if you were to put it in like a in a big sheet of muslin like when your grandma's making jam right and you have to squash all of the history of classical music down, right? The droplet that would come out the bottom, the perfect first droplet, would be a string quartet, right? It's based on, it's a complete spectrum. The, the string quartet is a spectrum of sound in related family instruments. So it's all strings, soprano, alto, tenor, bass, right? You've got all that sort of related vibrations and related harmony. And because of that, it's the most, it's the hardest structure to write for. And then some trad musicians with a fantastically inquiring mind want to explore the unification of, of sound, but not make pre-written compositions to impose on all the rules of string quartet writing, but just to use it as like a free form sketch pad to make up their own parts, they interweave and eventually collect into this beautiful kind of, it's a gorgeous sound, this group. So then we were like, right, well, we want to do an album. How are we going to do an album? And we'd done some recording while we were rehearsing before. And so we thought, well, what would be really nice is if we could have some mics and we could go somewhere and have that freedom to record whenever and whatever. We've had David Donaldson um, help us with this, um, who's uh, amazing. Um, and Greg Lawson actually uh, put us in touch with him and recommended him, which is which is so great. It's so great to have people who know each other and are comfortable working together as well. Oh, shiny mic time! <gasps> yes. With chrome and everything. Oh I mean, like that. Not a fingerprint on it. Writing and rehearsing and recording all at once uh, in a semi-remote <laughs> location um, and trying to think more in terms of process than in maybe really strict terms. It's We're setting something up here more than doing something established. That'll be the main one because everything's bouncing back off of that wall. Yeah. This one too a little bit. We we wanted to have somewhere that was like comfortable somewhere that we could spend all the time that we needed to take all the time because we haven't had a lot of time to rehearse as well as to record. And so we wanted to be somewhere where we, where we could all just be together for a while and not have as much time pressure as you'd normally have. Yeah. Um, we wanted to 
be more relaxed about it, hypothetically. <laughs> Well, the Roots Quartet are, are these incredibly optimistic musicians, right? Who are looking to express themselves in their form, but in a different way. And I think one of the things that's making our quartet work is, is the material. So, you know, we write it all and we arrange it all together. So it, it matches our playing and our strengths and... Um, yeah, I suppose whenever you put four string plays together, there's always going to be an element of string sound. Yeah. Whatever that you know genre is. But it's difficult because they're all working as individuals, and so each part, they have to find their part by feel. And so each part that is emerging, the second violin part, the viola part, the first violin part, the cello part, they're all looking to see where their part can travel and someone else is looking and then they can cross over and it's an entirely different way of actually making a string quartet work. It's like from inside with a lead sheet. So it's, it's a band, it works like a band, but within the structural confines of a string quartet. Recording a string quartet, it's a demanding uh, task and, uh, and 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 processes it requires a different approach to the whole thing because um, quite often for instance I play with different projects and we would maybe arrange things and you know everyone would know what they're doing and just walk in the studio uh, that's our parts that's our that's the tunes that's the arrangements uh, that's your cabin that's mine <laughs> I think with Ruth's quartet it sh shouldn't just sound good, it should sound how we are and in the moment, you know. Uh, it should be, uh, like we want to come up with something that reflects these few days together, and only these few days. You know, they've been trying to work out what, how they need to evolve as people, how they need to evolve as musicians, how their ears need to evolve differently from the music they play, What, how much precision is like, is just necessary and how to attain that precision and yet at the same time how to be free how to be semi-improvisational the way they make their parts is just jamming and finding stuff that works they're writing on the spot I mean they're doing it now while we're recording they're changing things all the time every single take is like different it's a nightmare actually. and that's not typical of a, of a traditional string quartet no because you're playing you're playing a piece of music by Beethoven and Beethoven said right I've thought about this more than you I've decided these are your parts and they're the parts you play and then you interpret those parts according to what you know what you feel the rules of you know music how it works in different periods of time well this is completely different because the quartet now is just like this skeleton shape like a clothes horse that's got four sides and they're just like hanging their own fabric over that clothes horse. We chose Greg because of his understanding of what we're trying to do. So there's quite a lot of it's quite a lot of maybe trad players that wouldn't get the string quartet thing, and would maybe I don't know some some people, but I, we know that he's had a lot of time in the classical world and sort of string physics you know knowing what works and what doesn't and how we can improve um but also he's got this side to him which is you know folky and with which is bagel and all, all that stuff he's, he he understands getting the vibe and the groove and sometimes there's a trade-off there um because if we went purely for string physics and string sounding stuff we might lose a bit of the vibe. So it's like getting that balance and he understands that. 
but it does mean that there are imbalances in dynamic when you just kind of play as you just play mm. without like really thinking about how this works. And and some of that I think we can actually just explore with bow speeds, like long chords, or even when parts have minims and they're working in unison, mm -hmm. Mm. to just consider how we unify our bow speeds together without it being a constriction, but actually it being the opposite. It liberates and into actually making more sound or I think it'd be really nice to work like that on stuff tonight because then it gets more kind of syntax into everyone's playing. Well, there's definitely some passages where uh, the arrangement would benefit in like from a different use of instrumentation, you know. Like mm -hmm. uh, obviously, it's cool as trad musicians to play like for instance myself and Matt to play unison, a tune, mm -hmm. boom, strong, you know, gets to the point. But mm -hmm. sonically, we can do much more mm -hmm. in certain moments, you know, yeah. instead of being always like around the same notes or the same kind of range mm -hmm. and stuff, just kind of trying to make it more interesting here and there. I was really expecting a couple of numbers to be like, ah, oh, it's not as good as that one, you know, it's a shame. Because that's the way it happens. Any, any album, yeah, there's always, always your favourites and then there's ones that don't work. But actually, there's nothing, there's just nothing that doesn't work. It's really, uh, that's a ridiculously strong. In fact, it might be that they're, they're simply there's too many really strong numbers. <laughs> like a test to composers if you could write for a string quartet if you could distill all of the ideas into four perfectly balanced voices and when those voices are balanced and all the parts are balanced and all the tunings balanced and every action is balanced perfectly the spectrum just comes alive and what you get from a string quartet is the sound of all those melded vibrations and you get like this thing that's bigger than a quartet. It becomes one voice, it becomes many voices. It's really hard to work out exactly how many voices you're listening to because they're all related to each other. Each instrument bleeds into the next instrument, which bleeds into the next instrument and all the way down, all the way through. They're all blending sound. And because the sounds are reciprocal with each other, they have to be the same vibrations. So if you get something wrong, if you get a frequency that's just not quite right, it jars with the next frequency, and then that frequency won't carry. So you kind of stop sound traveling, if you, unless you get it really fluent. It's the most complex thing. We're trying to see what can exist with our setup. Um, yeah, it's, it's very interesting. But it's also, for me, the fun part is that we really can't know what's, what the end result's going to be in any direction. So far it's promising, but there's always room for something awful to happen. If there are things that are not working, that haven't worked consistently, or you want another one, we have very briefly just fixed those. It might be one transition or one area, then we do a third take, and then we sit down and we listen to what we've got and if there's anything there you think all right well actually that section can we actually well we uh, take tempo markings before we start mm -hmm. the playthroughs and then between those three takes we've either got a complete take or we've got a take that has apart from that section if we've got good tempo we go back in have a listen to the tempo before and then just drop that section in and then when we, if we're happy and everyone's comfortable and say, well, between that, we've got it. We slim the file down, send it off to David and say, is this workable? Yeah, you know, so I mean, if for instance, um, you know, say violin left is a lot louder than violin right, then 
just sort of try readjusting them and make sure that you can get some form of balance you're yeah. rough and happy with. We are very much for individual people coming together. Emma and Rufus, uh, in terms of music, that bring a lot to the texture uh, and the rhythm uh, in different moments. Lombardi is um, a very passionate man, a, a man of the arts. He likes producing things and creating art. He's such a strong player and 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 very expressive in his playing. It's quite nice, it's really nice to play with him because he puts so much in that you can really feed off, off that. Um, and the food, I mean, the cooking is just amazing. I would love, it, David's Italian and I would love to spend more time in Italy. When he says he's gonna cook, I just, I'm delighted. Madeleine has got such a special style as well. I love how we interact, you know, how different we are in terms of playing. I think we, we work very well together as the two violinists. Her playing is so vibey, like she drives the tunes drive along and um, phenomenal actually. I've just hopefully bringing some like sonorous viola stuff lines to it that's like really resonate and bring out the quality of the viola in all of these different textures um, and some chordal things and some tunes as well and yeah just sort of pinching bits from everybody and reacting you know sort of like you know the viola is sort of like the mayonnaise of the sandwich you know it's just like a wee tasty bit that yeah goes in between. I'm kind of like that but more on the chaotic side where I like that element of not knowing and just doing and seeing what happens and that comes across musically as well I think we fall into the general quartet roles a lot of the time of first and second violin viola cello but that's not a, a rule and it's gonna dilute and diverge as we go along obviously I play the cello so I'm more holding up the low end but doing a lot more rhythm as well which is not what you'd see from a quartet cellist same as Emma on the viola, loads of rhythm. I feel like we're really, really, really close with most of it. I do too. Yeah. I do. I can remember when I started, I can't remember what instrument it was, maybe when I was on the violin, she learned that first, and I must have been about 10 years old. And I just, and my mum's reminded me of this, but I turned to mum and dad and I was like, I'd just really like to be able to play one day and make people feel the way I feel when I listen to music. And I think that's why, I mean, it sounds very, oh, I do it for other people. No, it's very self-gratifying, but um, I want to make music with, with people. I'm a viola player. We were destined to be part of a group, you know. Yeah, there are solo violists, but really we love being in the middle of it all. I love making a sound that creates a feeling and an emotion. And I still get that when I listen to other people, you know, when the music takes your breath away. And sometimes I think we get it and sometimes, I don't know, I, I want to be able to do that more so that 
we make a sound that makes the audience or whoever's listening feel something and in turn we feel it's just to do with feelings I suppose it makes you feel good music is one of many outlets as part of a larger thing because we've had this discussion quite a lot this week are you an artist are you a musician are you an instrumentalist a percussionist a, and what are you specific or generalized and I think the older I get the more I generalize out music to being a part of a greater whole so it's an enormously powerful thing on its own but when combined with other mediums or as part of other things it really makes a much bigger picture that you can't get in any other way time in my life I thought uh, that was my call that was my destiny you know I had to be a musician and that's it but then I started to ask myself is that true is that the only reason you know um, and is there something bigger uh, than just that as a reason and I I think my answer is yes there is and there is me uh, as an individual and my relation with myself and the world uh, out there and um, my relation with other people, with nature, with this universe, I suppose. I think maybe arts can help uh, this, this establishing this connection uh, more easily than other things. I hope Obviously, I hope that people like the album that we've made. I hope that we're satisfied with it as well. I'm fairly optimistic about that at this point. And I, I hope that we'll be able to actually spend a lot of time playing music in front of people, because um, we haven't had much of a chance to do that yet either. Um, and making an album is, is nice and great for exactly the reasons that you know, we've been talking about um, spending time getting to know each other, but it'll be even better to play it in front of people um, because I think that this music is is best when we can have like that live energy um, and and not be so tied to making it sound great this one time, but instead like be really in the moment and have it be different. All traditions have these areas where people are comfortable doing the same thing forever and ever and ever and ever and ever. Well, for their lives, right? And other people are looking at tradition as 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 an evolving form, and they're looking at what, how can I express myself according to what I feel with the history of music that I have at my disposal, right? So you get people like Martin Bennett who looked at tradition, understood it, and then took it to a place where some people really didn't want them to take it to, right? And would would oppose those ideas. And and all the time you got people who say no and people who say yes. And this beautiful kind of stretching of the fabric of what we all think of as as being stuff that we're allowed to do and stuff we're not allowed to do. So the idea that uh, traditional musicians would actually come across the shape of a string quartet and say, well, I fancy a bit of that. Is that going to work? You know. And most people would say, no, that's not going to work. But of course, you, you don't know that until you try that. <laughs>